Well, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the end of the letter to Colossians. Can I get an amen? Colossians chapter 4, uh, and we're going to read the conclusion today, starting in verse 7 and reading all the way to verse 18. And, and don't worry, with all those verses, I only have eight sermon points, so we should be out of here by 2 o'clock. Uh, starting in verse 7 of Colossians 4, let's stand together and let's read this con uh, concluding address to the church at Colossae, and as you will see, uh, also to the church at Laodicea. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, whose name, or who is called Justice, these are men, my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church that is in his, his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read, or read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This, this salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains, grace be with you. Amen. Father, as we look at your word today, and we understand that every stroke of the pen that went into compiling this living book is vital to the authority and instruction of our lives. We ask you to minister to us today as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In, this clo in these closing remarks, Paul gets very personal. And we learn a lot from his statements here starting in verse 7 about who his co closest companions, his closest associates are. And so a lesson for us today as we study this text is that we get to look into the friendships of the Apostle Paul, and then we say to ourselves as the modern-day church, who is it that I ought to have surrounding me, and who am I supposed to be for the brothers and sisters that are around me? So we, we learn a lot about the type of people that we're supposed to hang out with, the type of people that we're supposed to surround ourselves with, who these people are, what characterizes them. And my goal today is to share with you a little bit about each one of their character. And that's my eight points. There are eight men listed in this text that I want to share a little bit about so that you can see the kind of friends that the Apostle Paul had. Uh, how many of you believe that friends are important? That going through this life alone is very difficult. Friends are vitally important in holding you up, as the children's sermon said, and in helping you make it through the daily struggles. And we're going to see the kind of friends that Paul had and glean from that. Uh, and first off, I must say, uh, regardless of how you feel about this, something that I've proven to be true in my own life, and I know is true in all of your lives, who you spend most of your time with affects who you are. All right? You are affected by those who are in close proximity to you, those who you live life with, those who influence you, and those who you influence. You are affected by them. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Paul gives the warning, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. You hang out with evil people, your good habits begin uh, to look like theirs. And Paul understood that this life 
could not be lived alone. The life that God had called him to could not be lived alone. He needed some godly men around him to walk through this life. He could not do it alone. Uh, he understood that this calling that God had placed on his life could not be fulfilled alone. Uh, God's servants are made stronger by other servants. They're made stronger by each other. There's strength in numbers, and Paul understood that. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so we're there to do this together. We're there to uh, encourage one another. We're there to build one another up. And Paul never... Under any of the circumstances that we see throughout the New Testament and the letters that he wrote, he never ministered alone. Something else that that reminds me of is the uh, United States military. Uh, I didn't serve in the military, and so there's a lot of things that I don't know. Uh, but one thing I do know, and it's been highlighted very recently in a, a sermon that I was listening to, was that... Uh, no soldier is ever sent out to fulfill a duty alone. They never go alone. They always have comrades. And in the United States Army, in the soldier's creed, there are these two statements. Uh, it says, I am a warrior and a member of a team, and I will never leave a fallen comrade. And when I read those words... I feel it describes the Apostle Paul's ministry. I am the member of a team, and I am not going to be able to go against this alone, and there are going to be many people along the way that I'm going to pull along. There's going to be people that pull me along, and we're never going to leave a fallen comrade. We're going to attack this spiritual warfare together and answer the call of Jesus Christ together. That's the purpose of the local church. That's what we're here for, is to be equipped and to grow closer to one another so that we can go out there and stand together. Uh, one of the worst things, one of the easiest ways for Satan to gain victory over the church is through isolation. It's for him to isolate members from the team. It's for him in spiritual warfare to get individual believers separated from the flock. And that's when he's able to attack and gain the upper hand. And so Paul knew there was strength in numbers. We should learn that lesson today uh, as we study about these eight friends. So let's look at them. Uh, something that I want to introduce all of these eight with is that they counted the cost in being a companion with the Apostle Paul, and they counted it worthy. So we're looking at men of commitment. We're looking at men who counted the cost and forsook all that they had and followed this apostle in the work of the ministry. The first one being Tychicus. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Now, what do we know about this gentleman, Tychicus? We know uh, from five different New Testament references. And I'm going to refer to some of those. Uh, his name is mentioned five times in the New Testament. On Paul's third missionary journey, he went through Ephesus on his way to Jerusalem. And if you know anything about Paul's trip to Jerusalem, you know that Paul had already been warned that trouble awaited him there. But he went anyway because of the call of the gospel. And so he goes through Ephesus. It's very clear that he's going to be leaving Ephesus and headed to Jerusalem. And Paul desired to take some Greek, Greeks with him that represented the church in Asia Minor and Greece and the surrounding areas. And Tychicus was one of the Greeks who agreed to go with Paul to Jerusalem. Now think of what he's agreeing to. I've got to leave my home, my family, my church and go with Paul to a place where it's already been declared there's trouble waiting on him there. It's not going to be a good visit. Sign me up. This is the kind of guy we're dealing with. I'll go with you. I'm going to follow you and, and, and come alongside you. So we first meeting, meet him in Acts 20, verse 4, when he joins Paul on this journey to Jerusalem. His willingness to go with him showed his selfless servant heart. We want to surround our, ourselves with people who 
have that selfless servitude about them. This was not a journey to be taken lightly. Paul uh, was given those warnings, and yet Tychicus committed anyway. Now, at the time of Paul writing Colossians, the letter to the church at Colossae, it had been two years since his trouble in Jerusalem. So we add a little bit to that, and at this moment, Tychicus had been by Paul's side for a little over two years. But we learn from other references, one being in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that Tychicus remained with Paul to the end of his life, which at that time had been about four years, because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul desired... Now this shows you the the credibility of this guy. Paul desired to see Timothy one last time. But what kept Timothy from coming and visiting Paul? Timothy was a pastor of a church. He couldn't just leave the church. He needed somebody to fill the pulpit. Guess who Paul sent to him to fill the pulpit? Tychicus. So here's a guy, a faithful servant in the Lord, that is so dear to Paul's heart that he says, Tychicus, I need you to go and fill Timothy's pulpit because I need Timothy to come to me before I die. I want to fellowship with him. So we know that he spent about four years, a little more four years of his life with Paul, and Paul entrusted him with uh, the very, this shows the, the trustworthiness, the very important task of taking this letter written to the Colossians and delivering it over 100 miles to the church at Colossae and Laodicea. A a very uh, horrendous journey on foot. So he took this letter, and it's it's known that he also took the letter to Ephesus, what we call Ephesians, and it's very likely that he also delivered the letter Philemon because Philemon lived in Colossae. So we, we see the trustworthiness of this guy. Paul had written these letters. He delivers them by this faithful servant to the appropriate audiences. Uh, Paul lists three specific character traits about this man in these verses. He says that he is a beloved brother, he is a faithful minister or servant, and he's a fellow servant in the Lord. Guy with a servant heart who is faithful to stand by you. Everybody, everybody would like a friend like that, amen? Uh, and, and we want those people who are always willing to go the extra mile. I'm going to share with you somebody who... I believe is like that. Uh, he, he doesn't want the recognition, but, but one of our deacons, Stephen Bertram, I think is a modern day Tychicus because of his servant mindset and his willingness to, to go the extra mile. And, and, and you better believe he's one of the guys that I enjoy having close by in the ministry. And so find friends that model uh, those characteristics. The second guy that we have here is Onesimus. Anybody want to jump on name in their child that? All right, I figured with these eight names and all the babies that this church is known for having, maybe we see some of them pop up, maybe not. Uh, Onesimus in verse 9 says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, he's going to accompany Tychicus back to Colossae. Uh, They will make known to you all the things that's happening here in Rome where where I'm on house arrest. All right, so you've got Tychicus and Onesimus coming to you. They're bringing this letter. They're going to make known to you everything that's happening. But let me tell you who Onesimus is. Some of you know this. Onesimus is the cause for writing the letter Philemon. Philemon was a slaveholder who was a wealthy leader in Colossae, and it's very likely that the church of Colossae met in Philemon's house. All the churches in the New Testament were house churches. They didn't have their own buildings. They met in homes of faithful believers. Onesimus was a runaway slave that belonged to Philemon. And now Paul is sending Onesimus back to Colossae, and the letter to Philemon, which is right after Colossians, says, receive him as a brother. He's a changed man. Forgive him for running away. So so let me tell you what this running away did. Onesimus ran away from Philemon. He ran to Rome. When he got to Rome, he met the Apostle Paul. When he met the Apostle Paul, Paul shared the gospel with him, and he got saved. And now that he was saved, Paul began to disciple him. You know, we, we learn from this relationship that we're not called to just make converts. We're called to make disciples. And so he pulls Onesimus, this runaway slave, close to him, and they live life together in Rome. 
Uh, not a whole lot of living. Paul was arrested, but, but he, he's able to draw Onesimus close to him and disciple him in the faith, and he's now sending him back to his hometown as a brother in Christ. And he calls this, this runaway slave a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. There's two things we can learn from this relationship. The first thing we can learn is the mistakes of your past do not define you. How many of you are thankful for that? All right, we got verses like 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I, I am new in this identity that I have in Christ. But the second thing we can learn from this relationship is that we are called not to just make converts. Paul was not called just to share the gospel with Onesimus. He was called to live life with him and make a disciple out of him. We're called to go into all the nations and make disciples baptizing him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I tell you, that's a, a great place where D groups can, can come in. Uh, groups where you get into uh, three or four believers who uh, are, are desiring to grow in the Lord and you hold one another accountable and you study the scriptures together and you pray together. If you're not in one of those and want to be, please come see us. We, we would desire that every member of our church be in a D group because we see that the people who are in those relationships are the ones that are growing the fastest, that are in those accountability spiritual relationships. So we, we get to the third guy that Paul mentions. Uh, his name is Aristarchus. Look at the first part of verse 10. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Verse 11 tells us something about Aristarchus because it takes three gentlemen and calls them all Jews. These are the only guys, these are the only fellow servants who are of the circumcision. All my, Paul was a Jew. All my people have abandoned me except for these three guys. So we know that Aristarchus was a Jew, and we know that he was a fellow prisoner. But what else do we know about him? And I want to share it with you from the, the book of Acts, Acts 19, that during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus, that's where Aristarchus appears. In Ephesus, uh, and, and here's how he appears in Acts 19. He gets seized by a mob who is attacking anybody who has association with the Apostle Paul. So if you think in your mind for a moment about the story of Peter, what did Peter do to avoid getting seized by the mob? He denied his allegiance, right? What did Aristarchus not do? He did not deny his allegiance. He, when the mob came to him in Ephesus... And seized him, he stood strong even when times got tough. He was faithful to being a companion to the Apostle Paul. And I don't know about you, but when you get on the when when I get on the front lines of spiritual warfare, I want guys standing beside me that when times get tough and it looks like uh, spiritually speaking, or one day maybe even physical, that we're about to lose our lives, that they're gonna say, I'll lose it with you. And I'm gonna stand here till the end and we're gonna fight this battle together. That's the kind of guy that Aristarchus was, and that's how we should be for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, he didn't deny his allegiance to Paul. We learn from Acts 20 that he accompanied Paul on his return to Jerusalem. We learn from Acts 27 that he accompanied Paul on his voyage to Rome. And then as he is writing the Colossian letter, Aristarchus is there with him in Rome under arrest. Now let me share with you that it's, it's been thought that it's very unlikely that Aristarchus was also a prisoner. So this really helps us in, in examining his character. It's very unlikely that he was also a prisoner of Rome. So the reason why Paul would call him a fellow prisoner is because even though Paul got arrested and Aristarchus didn't, Aristarchus gave up his freedom to go and bear this burden with his companion, the Apostle Paul. I am going to experience this arrest with you. I'm going to be in this home with you every step of the way. Even though the, future, the present and the future look very dim, I am right here beside you, and I'm going to forsake being a free man to come and sit here beside you while you are a prisoner. I will be a prisoner with you. I will bear this load with you. I will empathize and sympathize with all that you're going through. I will eat the food that you eat. I will sleep where you sleep. I will be confined to this room with you as a fellow prisoner in the Lord. 
And everyone needs the kind of friend that will stick with them through difficult times and won't abandon them when times get tough. We need companions that will get down in the trenches and experience suffering with us. Think of that friend that when you go through tough times, you see them weep. When you go through times of sorrow, you see them sorrowful. And they bear those burdens with you. And, and then think about, how can I be that person for my brother or sister in Christ? How can I, as uh, Romans twelve fifteen says, how can I rejoice when they rejoice and weep when they weep? Because that's my calling as a brother in Christ or as a sister in Christ, to bear one another's burdens. Then the fourth guy that we come across is Mark. Now, all of you know Mark. This is the guy who wrote one of the four Gospels. Uh, his full name would be John Mark. This referenced many times in Scripture. And the second part of verse 10, it says, with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, and then there's a parenthesis. Paul needed to qualify that this guy is different now. All right? Uh, you know about him denying me in the past, but parentheses about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. All right, he's, he's one of my boys. He's, he's one of my companions. Mark was the reason that Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 and Acts 15 split up and went their separate ways. In Acts 13, Mark was on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. Mark is Barnabas' cousin. He was much younger. And the times got tough and he fled. That hurt Paul. All right? So the next time that Paul was getting ready to go on a missionary journey and he invites Barnabas to go with him, Barnabas says, can I bring Mark? Paul says, no. He betrayed me on our last journey. You're not putting me in that position again. Barnabas felt so strongly about giving Mark another chance that Barnabas said, well, then I'll go on my own missionary journey. I'll take Mark with me. And Paul said, okay, fine. And he goes on his own missionary journey and they go two separate ways. Well, sometime between Acts 15 and now, Mark has become one of Paul's close associates. So close that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, at the end of Paul's life, guess who Paul asks for? Verse 11 of 2 Timothy 4, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. All right, so what can we learn from this? Paul told the Col Colossians that if Mark came to them, you should welcome him. He, don't reject him because of his past failures. I'll tell you what we can learn from this. There are going to be people who let you down in serving the Lord. If it hadn't already happened, it's going to happen. And when that happens, we need to be careful not to totally write them off as being useful in the Lord's work. All right, so Mark returns. He knows what it's like to be unfaithful. He has carried the guilt of abandoning Paul and Barnabas, and then he got the second chance of being a missionary again with Barnabas, and he has grown from his mistakes. Let me tell you something about people who have experienced unfaithfulness. They've experienced betrayal, and they've done it themselves, but now they're faithful again. You want me to tell you what kind of value they are to you? They know the cost of unfaithfulness, and they are motivated to remain faithful. And so when you have people who have those mistakes in their past, but yet they're striving to do the Lord's work, let them come alongside you and disciple them and, and help grow them. Uh, they will be a great testimony to others who may have doubt in their hearts, in your vicinity, uh, as Mark would have been. I heard someone say one time that, experience is the best teacher. But then another person disagreed with that statement and said, no, I think somebody else's experience is the best teacher. You know, then I don't have to pay the price myself. I get to learn from them paying the price. And that, that's one of the things that Mark brought to the table. So if any of you want to make those mistakes and then come and share with me the life lesson that you get from it, I will be sure and gain from that experience. So that was supposed to be funnier than it was. It's really awkward standing on stage when you share a joke and nobody laughs. It's a good time to drink some water. All right, so that brings us to number five. Actually, you get used to it. In the 10 years that I've been here, I've said a lot of jokes that nobody laughed at, so I 
I'm not uncomfortable at all. Uh, look at verse 11. We've got a guy named Jesus Justice. All right? The name Jesus means Savior. Okay, we know that that's a tall order, a tall name to live up to. His actual name is Justice, which means righteous one. Okay, and it's evident from Paul's description of him that he did rise to that name. Uh, verse 11 is all we know about this guy. He's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. And so what do we learn from this one verse? Jesus, who is called Justice, is one of the three workers for the kingdom of God who were Jewish, that stuck with Paul. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And so here we have a fellow Jew who agreed to come alongside the Apostle Paul, whose name means righteous one, and he was one of the only ones that did not forsake Paul in this journey, and he was a great encourager and comforter to Paul. Just for me knowing those two things about him, that he encouraged and comforted Paul, lets me know that I need friends like Justice. People who will come alongside you, who know where you've been, who know what you're going through, and they are there to encourage and to comfort you. We are called to be that for one another. The fact that he was willing to leave his people despite the ridicule and the persecution and join Paul shows great commitment, which is something that is a, a rare commodity these days. That even in the face of, of conflict, I will be committed and I will comfort and encourage you. And every one of us needs those type friends. Number six, Epaphras. We do know, we do know a lot more about him. Uh, we know that he is the church planner that planted the church in Colossae. If you go back to the beginning of the letter, Paul references Epaphras. Uh, Colossae was a church, that, the church of the Colossians was a church that Paul never visited. All right, it's a church that Epaphras planted and was most likely the current pastor of that church. And in verses 12 and 13, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you. He cares about you. And those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Epaphras had traveled to Rome. If we jump back to the beginning of the letter, he had traveled to Rome to tell Paul about all the heresy that was being taught in Colossae and Laodicea and that uh, Lycus Valley region. That this is the kind of teachings you're, these people are susceptible to. That provoked Paul's letter to them. Be careful, this is your identity now. Live like this, not like they're telling you to live. And Epaphras was going to return to them because he's the pastor of their church. He had gone on a little missionary trip to visit Paul in Rome. But what do we know about Epaphras? We know that he was a prayer warrior. We know that his prayers were so uh, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. And what he was praying was that you may stand perfect and complete in the, all the will of God. That you would follow his plan for your life. And I want to tell you, under this friendship category, some of my greatest encouragement in the ministry are those that I know of who have committed to be prayer warriors for me. Everybody needs that person that they are totally confident that when they come to them and they share a burden, they can walk away knowing that that burden is going to be lifted before the throne of God regularly until something's done with it. Those prayer warriors that have committed to praying for you. We need to be that for one another and we need friends that will be that for us. And Epaphras was that guy. Number seven is Luke. Um, I guess one of the applications, everybody needs a doctor they can carry around with them. Right? Uh, verse 14, Luke was the beloved physician. Luke was Paul's personal physician. Paul got very sick on his first missionary journey. Luke came to help him and never left his side. Stayed with him. So Luke was the first medical missionary. In, in all senses of the term, he surrendered his special talents and his occupation to the Lord. Let me tell you how this would benefit us uh, not necessarily going and find a doctor, but if you find a doctor that wants to come trail me around everywhere, I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, he can even tie it to the church if he wants to. Uh, but uh, here's where this is very helpful. is finding people, and these are the kind of people you need close to you. Finding people who will take their occupation and treat it as a ministry. Do you know those people? Are you those people? Where, you, where they 
take the talents they have and the platform they've been given in culture and they use it as a ministry. You need to surround yourself with such people. I always give the advice. I have a lot of people that come to me and say, Brian, I'm feeling a calling into ministry, but I'm currently doing this. And I always respond the same way. Until you take what you're doing and use it as a ministry, why would God call you to something else? Take where you're at and the skills you've been given and the talents that God has bestowed upon you and use them to serve him right where you are. Those are the kind of people we need to be encouraging and surrounding ourselves with. People who are doing the work of the ministry in their occupations. And that's what Luke did. And we know that Luke was a very intelligent man, and so they probably had some very engaging conversations. Not only was he a physician, but he's the great author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And so you could imagine he and Paul had a lot uh, to talk about. And then the last guy, they didn't save the best for last, uh, Demas, last part of verse 14, and Demas. That's all he said. <laughs> and Demas. It's not good. Because let me tell you, the next time we hear about Demas, it's in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 9. Paul saying, help. Demas has abandoned me on the mission field for materialism. He left me alone. He got a, a material vibe and wanted the things of this world. That's what 2 Timothy 4 says. He desired the things of this world, and he abandoned me. Who, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? That's the, the statement that we hear. But here's what I want you to learn from this. Jesus had Judas. Paul had Demas. If you're in ministry long enough, you're going to have people that are going to disappoint you. You're going to have people that are going to forsake you. You're going to have people that don't follow through with your commitments. When that happens, remind yourself that two of the greatest leaders this world has ever known, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, had that happen to them. It's not necessarily something I need to take personal when it happens. I continue doing the work of the Lord that he's called me to, even when people who are closest to me betray me. And so that last one's kind of a lesson in, in hindsight. We don't, we don't go out and choose friends that we think will betray us. But when it happens, we, we continue on the course that God has set for us. Not taking it personal and not being defeated because of it. And so I want to sum these eight relationships up as we close the study on Colossians and, and, and all of its instruction on walking in the new identity that we have in Christ. Uh, the final charge is to be intentional about who you surround yourself with. Be intentional about who you let into that inner circle. Be, int be intentional about who you seek out relationships with and whether you're the discipler or whether you're the disciple uh, and, and the servant and the prayer warrior and the committed and the one who will get down in the trenches. But the application is twofold today. That as a church family, we look at all these vital relationships that the Apostle Paul had. And we say, okay, I need these relationships in my church family. And I, and here's the second part of that application, and I need to be that for my church family. And so the, the call today from this passage is get involved and don't settle for just showing up for worship and leaving with no connection points outside of that. You need the relationships that God is providing for you in this church. I can guarantee you that, well, it's sad to say with Demas being in the list, but I can guarantee you that all eight of these people are represented in this church. But you have to seek those relationships out, and you have to be willing to provide that for those around you. So get, get involved in each other's lives. I need these relationships. You need these relationships. And we need to be that for each other. Because no Christian can...
can walk in this spiritual warfare alone. And they haven't been called to walk alone. We're a team. And we're not going to leave a fallen comrade behind. That's our commitment and the calling from the Lord. So get involved. Seek out these relationships. And let's fight this fight together. As the Apostle Paul understood, I cannot accomplish this work alone. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the example that the Apostle Paul sets for us. Lord, I'm so thankful for the instruction that you have given us to us through him. With all the letters that he has written and the the instructions that it gives us for daily life to walk worthy of this new identity in Christ. But Lord, even in him highlighting the the different relationships that he experienced along the way, the men who were faithful to him, the, the iron that sharpened his countenance, help us to glean from that and know that we cannot walk through this life alone, that we cannot fight this spiritual warfare alone, And that we must lean on our brothers and sisters and rely on them and depend on them and that they need to be able to do that for us. So please, Lord, prevent us from isolating ourselves. Prevent us from separating ourselves from the relationships in the church. There is strength in numbers. Satan only stands a chance when he gets us separated. So, Father, there, there may be people here today that, have, that they know what that isolation feels like. They feel disconnected. Uh, maybe it's from being absent, or maybe it's just from, uh, fr- from not making those relational connections. Lord, I pray that you will do a mighty work in that through your Holy Spirit, that you will knit them together with other believers in this body so that they can stand strong as, as Paul knew that when I have these men around me, I'm able to stand stronger in this calling. That's a truth that is tested, tried, and, and remains true that, uh, that we need one another as we strive to, to know you more and to make you known and as we constantly fight against the principalities and the powers of this air. So Lord, point those people out to us. Uh, Put us in close proximity with those that you want us to engage in these uh, intimate, fruitful, and discipleship relationships. And that we may stand together on the mountaintops and in the valleys in the face of Satan, linking arms together no matter what the cost. We've heard the saying that a chain is only as strong as it's weakest link and we want to bind together and strengthen one another in serving you each and every day as times get tough we stand together we fight together we live together uh, in the face of adversity thank you for the example you've set for us in the apostle paul and thank you for the power and the strength you give us through your son jesus christ so that we can be that for other people we ask all this in jesus name amen